Hi, John Herman here, back to do another lesson. Today, I'm going to start a multi-week study on Martin Luther. I did this study several years ago, but this time I'm going to try to condense the material into just the highlights, since my original notes were about 50 pages in length. Even so, Luther was such a dynamic and forceful figure, and you can read that as a stubborn and opinionated German if you like, that it might be hard to know what to leave out. We'll see. The framework of the material is based on the North Carolina Synod Reformation study that was presented several years ago. But, of course, I have embellished that as I have a habit of doing with additional findings. I apologize to those who have already heard this material, but at least for me, I found that I had forgotten most of what I had taught and found myself laughing and crying all over again at Luther's style and conviction. I want to get, begin with a Reader's Digest version of the history of the Christian Church up until Luther's time. This could obviously entail years of study, but I'll try to condense it into five minutes or less. I think it'll help you understand where Luther was coming from when he wrote his 95 Theses. Also, when you sit back and view all of the events that took place before and after the Reformation, I think you'll see the hand of God at work, kind of, kind of like the story of Esther. That's what it reminded me of. Anyway, let's begin. Up until the 4th century, Christianity was mainly confined to Israel, the Near East, and Northern Africa. But then, during the 300s, several significant events occurred. First, Roman Emperor Constantine declared that Christians could now worship as they saw fit without persecution. Up until this point, Christians were still being persecuted. His sudden decision was due to a vision that he saw right before an important battle. What he saw was an image of a cross spread across the sky with the words, Conquer by this. He was so moved that he emblazoned the Christian symbol of the cross on all of his soldiers' shields, and he handily won the battle, vastly increasing his domain. He became an immediate follower of Christ. Next, he moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, which was in Turkey. Uh, today it's the city of Istanbul. In the year 380, Christianity was declared the state religion of Rome. At that time, the entire Roman Empire had been divided into five geographic sections. Each section consisted of a government district and a church diocese. They both shared the same borders. Disputes soon arose within the church diocese, specifically between the bishops who headed each one. In particular, the Bishop of Rome, also known as the Pope, thought he was due more respect than the other four bishops. The greatest animosity be uh, occurred between the church located in Rome and the one located in Constantinople. So what do they say about a house divided? Already it started. In 476, German invaders attacked Rome, and the Roman Empire ceased to exist. The invaders were a mixture of Arians and pagans. Now, the Arians were semi-Christians. They accepted Jesus, but not the idea of the Trinity. They also believed that there was a time when Jesus did not exist, and that he was created by God. However, because of the nebulous similarity of the Christian beliefs, they allowed the Roman Catholic Church to remain preserved. So the two invading groups existed side by side with Roman Catholics for many years. The Catholics saw a mission to educate the pagans, and in this way, the church began to grow in Europe. And by the year 1000, all of the nations in Europe had been Christianized. On top of that, 
some of these converts became missionaries themselves and spread the word to more foreign lands. Again, God had a plan. During this time of growth, disputes continued between Rome and the Eastern churches. The bishop or pope of Rome was allowed to remain, and gradually his role became more and more secular, since the emperor of Rome no longer existed. The pope gradually became an unchallenged political leader as well as a spiritual one. Up until this time, the role of the pope was primarily theological in nature, but now he became more and more involved with his secular issues. As is often true with politics, shock of shocks, this new generation of popes began corrupt practices, which included simony. Now, simony is the practice of buying church roles, including the selection of the pope himself. In one case I found, the 15-year-old daughter of a noble family became the concubine of Pope Sergius III. She then ensured that her resulting son John was seated as Pope John XI. She accomplished this by having her former lover, the, re the reigning Pope John X, murdered. And so it went. Over the next few hundred years, things went from bad to worse. There was much infighting as to who would be the next pope. Many times, two or three would claim the position, and this divided the church even more. Competing popes would often excommunicate each other, and there were forced abdications. By the 1500s, the church had become very powerful, but also very corrupt. More and more church leadership positions were being bought. Rich families would get younger family members appointed as bishops, priests, and heads of monasteries, even though they were not interested in the religious life. As a result, the poor parishioners suffered because their leaders didn't know anything about Christianity, and therefore the Christian teaching differed from region to region. Church leaders, including the Pope, became political figures concerned primarily with getting wealth for themselves and for the Church. This became apparent with the sale of indulgences in order to pay for the construction of St. Peter's Cathedral and to pay off some papal bribes, specifically to pay off the Pope in return for certain appointments. The indulgences took advantage of the guilt and fear of the average person. With just some money, you could buy comfort and security of deceased loved ones by reducing their time in purgatory. A favorite saying of John Tetzel, he was sort of an indulgence salesman, if you will, was, As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. One did not have to be overly religious or pious to get the job done. One problem was that this taught people that works were needed to contribute to justification. One had to do something in order to obtain salvation. People at that time were uncertain about their own destiny and were taught that God was a righteous, judgmental, and wrathful God. To make matters worse, Sermons were spoken in Latin, which meant that parishioners from other countries, such as Germany, didn't learn much about Christianity at all. All they got was the interpretation of the crooked priests. But even that was sparse, since many priests did not speak the language of the locals. All of this was in the works on the eve of the Reformation. Enter Martin Luther. Now, Luther was born to peasant parents. His father wanted him to become a lawyer. At 15, he was sent to several different schools, and he learned Latin, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. He described those years as living in hell. He was a very good debater, though, and he utilized his talents of logical thinking. These debates often centered on religious topics. Afterwards, he attended the University of Erfurt, 
which he described as a beer house and a whorehouse. He did receive his master's degree, though, and went on to law school. He quickly dropped out, however, and started taking classes in philosophy and theology. Looking back, it would seem that all of these learned disciplines were preparing him for a specific plan orchestrated by God. Then, the story goes, one night he was riding home during a thunderstorm and was almost struck by lightning. He cried out, Help! Santa Anna, I will become a monk! He regretted making the vow, but shortly thereafter he quit school and entered the Augustinian monastery. His father was not a happy camper. He dedicated himself to a monastic life by fasting, engaging in lengthy prayers, pilgrimages, and confessions. He prayed all 150 psalms at least once a week. He studied the Bible and often spent a day pondering just one thought. He made great efforts to please God by doing good works and serving others and praying for their souls. However, he felt that he was still not pleasing God. It was common belief at the time that God kept a sort of an Excel spreadsheet, if you will, recording, recall, recording all of one's good and bad deeds. It was assumed that the bad ones outnumbered the good ones right out of the gate and thus condemned a person to hell, or at least to a cleansing punishment in purgatory. One way to avoid that ordeal was to be punished for one's sins in this life. The best monks were those who repented of their sins by fasting, praying, depriving themselves of sleep, and enduring self-whippings. Luther did all of those and more, but still felt no peace. He describes this part of his life as having deep, sorrowful despair. He said, I lost touch with Christ the Savior and Comforter and made him the jailer and hangman of my poor soul. His logic was thus. How could he confess his own sins when he knew that the only reason he did that was to receive the favor of God? Every act of confession there was therefore another sin. Luther's superior at the monastery perceived his frustration and suggested something to divert his focus from himself. He ordered him to pursue an academic career. Over the next years, Luther was ordained as a priest, taught theology at Wittenberg University, received his doctorate, was promoted to chair of theology, and was received into the Senate of the University of Wittenberg. Wow! During this time of teaching, he focused on studying scripture, particularly the book of Romans. He came to believe that the church had lost sight of several central truths. He began to realize that salvation is a gift of God's grace that is received by faith and a trust in God's promise to forgive sins for the sake of Christ's death on the cross. He said, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. This concept is what separates us from the Catholics. We all fall short in following God's laws and all deserve judgment. But, as you know, God has worked out a plan whereby he accepts the sacrifice of his son as payment for our sins. This pardon is received through faith alone excluding all works. This, of course, does not mean that we can just behave as we want. If we accepted the gift but did not accept Christ's teachings, we would be just hypocrites. If we really wanted to be a disciple of, of Christ, we must put our lives in reverse and make some concrete changes. This is known as repentance. This will result in our doing Christ-like acts, but these works in and of themselves are not done for a reward. 
If that were the case, we could do them without repenting and changing our lives. It's tempting to believe that, though, because it puts us in control, and we like that. We can buy our way into heaven without changing one iota. The Catholic Church disagreed with Luther's stand on the matter to the point that it issued a decree that if anyone believing that faith alone would save them from their sins would be excommunicated. One practice of the Catholic Church that really irritated Luther was the sale of indulgences. He offered to debate the Archbishop on this and other subjects that bothered him as well. He composed a list of 95 theses which were generally one sentence statements and nailed them to the castle church door on the Halloween of, of 1517. Subject matter included the forgiveness of sins, beliefs regarding purgatory, and of course the sale of indulgences. His purpose was to start a debate, not a war. However, the printing press had just been invented. These theses were quick, quickly translated from Latin to German, copied, and within two months had spread throughout all of you, Europe. The papacy was not happy. The church immediately issued what is known as a papal bull. This was an official document that demanded that Luther recant 41 theses from his writings. He burned the bull, in effect giving the Pope an unkind gesture, shall we say. He was given a second chance to appear at the Diet of Worms. This was an assembly of the officials of the Roman Church. He was again asked publicly to recant his statements. This is what he said. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted in my conscience as captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. At the end of the speech, Luther raised his arm in the traditional salute of a knight winning about. <laughs> the guy had nerve. Within a week, he was excommunicated and declared an outlaw, wanted dead or alive with no repercussions to the killer. Before he could be apprehended, however, the prince of Luther's state of Saxony had him, in quotes, kidnapped and hid him in the Wartburg castle. He remained there for about a year. During that time, he was not about to sit idle, so he translated the Greek New Testament into German, the language of the people. He was the first to accomplish that feat. Because of the printing press, and the impeccable timing of its invention, over 5,000 copies were sold in the first two months. Within a few years, it became a German bestseller. It would seem again that God had a plan. Now, during the time he was at Wartburg, there became a great unrest in Wittenberg, where the Reformation had begun. Radicals were interpreting Luther's ideas into justification for smashing statues and images in churches. Things were getting out of hand and the town summoned Luther. He secretly returned to Wittenberg and preached eight sermons there, completely vilifying the protesters. In these sermons, he hammered home the primacy of core Christian values such as love, patience, charity, and freedom, and reminded the citizens to trust God's worth rather than violence to bring about necessary change. An excerpt from one of his sermons. Do you know what the devil thinks when he sees men use violence to propagate the gospel? He sits folded arms behind the fire of hell and says with malignant looks and frightful grin, Ah, how wise these madmen are to play my game. 
Let them go on. I shall reap the benefit. I delight in it. But when the devil sees the word, meaning Jesus, running and contending alone on the battlefield, then he shudders and shakes for fear. The effect of Luther's intervention was immediate. After the sixth sermon, one of the town officials remarked, Oh, what a joy has Dr. Martin's return spread among us. His words, through divine mercy, are bringing back every day misguided people into the way of the truth. Unfortunately, by that time, the revolt had spread far and wide. It morphed into what was a widespread revolt of the peasants of about 300,000 protesting religious and economic issues. Churches, monasteries, castles, and libraries were burned and destroyed. Luther condemned the violence and finally sided with the aristocracy whose armies finally subdued the peasants. He even wrote a book entitled Against the Murderous Thieving Hordes of Peasants in which Luther condemned the violence as the devil's work and called for the nobles to put down the rebels like mad dogs. He wrote, Therefore, let everyone who can smite, slay, stab, secretly or openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel. He went on to say, Fine Christians they are. I think there is a, not a devil left in hell. They have all gone into the peasants. Their raving has gone beyond all measure. Over a hundred thousand peasants were ultimately killed. And a lot of that was because of his backing and suggestions to the aristocracy. He argued three points for supporting the destruction of the protesters. Point number one. First, in choosing violence over lawful submission to the secular government, they were ignoring Christ's counsel to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Second, the violent actions of rebelling, robbing, and plundering placed the peasants outside the law of God and empire, so they deserved death in body and soul. Lastly, Luther charged the rebels with blasphemy for calling themselves Christian brethren while committing their sinful acts under the banner of the gospel. Well, that was sort of eye-opening to me. On this note, I'm going to stop for the week. I think we have at least touched on the historical aspect of the evolution of the Christian church up to Luther's time and why he thought he did what he did. He thought and did what he did. In the next week or two, I want to focus more on Luther and his accomplishments, his stand on certain issues, and about his per personal life, including his marriage to Katerina and what their life together was like. Now, as I did this, I realized that some of Luther's words and actions may be controversial or new to you. Some of them were to me. Therefore, I am going to try to hold a Zoom meeting this evening, July 26, at 7 p.m. I invite you to join so that we can talk about the lesson so far and address any comments or concerns that you might have. As we continue with our study of Luther, we will find other instances where we either may or absolutely do not agree with his stand. But we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Pastor Megan alluded to this fact with her very appropriate comments regarding cancel culture in her sermon last week. I want to leave you with two of Luther's statements that I think are appropriate for today's talk. The first, when I am angry, I can pray well and preach well. The second, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. <laughs>